I'm Andrew Hollenbach, Associate Professor, Department of Genetics at Louisiana State University in New Orleans, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Laura Dickey, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychology and Behavioral Sciences at Louisiana Tech University. Laura, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So if you could describe what is gender identity and how does it develop and or change over time? Gender identity is a person's felt uh, expression of who they are as a gendered person. <clears throat> For most people, we'll call them cisgender, their gender matches the sex they were assigned at birth. So someone has a baby, out pops the baby, the doctor says, oh, it's a boy or oh, it's a girl. And for most people, cisgender people, that matches their gender, who they are, how they dress, uh, the ways they talk, um, the ways that they relate to people, matches. But for transgender people, or people whose gender identity doesn't match their sex assigned at birth, that's not the same. And most people think of gender as male or female. You have two choices, and we call that a gender binary. Transgender people don't necessarily feel that they fit in that binary, depending on their gendered sense of themselves. So they could identify as male or female, which may or may not be the same as their sex as assigned at birth, or they could identify with some other gender entirely, which oftentimes people call themselves genderqueer, or providers may refer to those individuals as gender nonconforming. They don't conform to our expectations of how they would be based on their sex that's assigned at birth. So what are the terms that are frequently used to describe gender identity within the LGBT community? Sure. Uh, transgender is oftentimes thought of as an umbrella term that covers anybody who is gender nonconforming. It could also be an individual term for individuals who don't make any kind of a medical transition. So that would be hormones or surgery, some uh, amount of those. Uh, a social transition would be where they change their name, change their uh, gender that they use, change the ways that they dress. <clears throat> you also have cross-dressers would fit into that umbrella as well. So those are people who dress in a manner that's different than their sex assigned at birth. Most cross-dressers are heterosexual men, uh, research shows most cross-dressers heterosexual men. You also have drag kings and drag queens. Those are people who perform in attire that's different than their sex as assigned at birth. Uh, I mentioned genderqueer individuals. We also have transsexuals. Those are individuals who typically take, make a medical transition. What's important about all these labels is you really need as a provider to use the one that your patients most identify with. And don't assume that just because you saw somebody else who identifies as transgender that the next person you see identifies in that way as well. Really use the language that the person is choosing to use for themselves. And that may change over time. So in addition to basically respecting the patient's wishes in terms of how they wish to identify, why is it also clinically relevant that physicians understand these various different terms? Transgender people are in some ways a little bit reluctant to seek care, especially if they have the sense that who they would be accessing that care from isn't up to speed. And it isn't the trans patient's responsibility to train that individual. Uh, so if if one of your goals as a physician or as a medical provider is to make sure that you're culturally competent in that care, that includes not just questions of race and ethnicity and age and the other things that we typically associate that yeah. with, but it's also about gender identity and sexual orientation. And it's important to note that trans people could be anywhere on the sexual orientation scale. They could identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or straight, or pansexual is another term that's often used, or even queer. Um, and, and so if we go into those 
conversations with our patients, assuming that people will be the way that we expect them to be, we may be surprised. So how can health professionals create a clinical environment to support transgender and gender nonconforming patients? I think it starts with really basic uh, things like what are the restrooms that are available in your office? If you have a restroom that has a toilet and a sink and a door that locks, there's no reason for it to say men or women next to it. It can just simply say restroom. Uh, when it comes to things like paperwork, uh, what what kinds of questions are you asking people on the paperwork? When you ask them about their sex, are you giving them two choices? Or if, you, if you're asking them about sex, are you also asking them about gender? What about marital status? Do you have a place that allows for the ways that relationships can be kind of complicated? Uh, if you're not conforming to the heteronormative expectations that so many people have. Um, Another issue is what kinds of reading material do you have in your office space? Uh, are all of your staff trained in that cult same cultural competence? So that's everyone from the receptionist that they meet when they first walk in to the nurse that takes their blood pressure and their other vital signs uh, to the physician assistant who's going to prep the room and all of those kinds of things. You know, everybody needs to have that uh, level of knowledge that is respectful of their patients that they're serving. What name are they using when they call the patient back into the room? Uh, what kind of safe, if a trans man needs gynecological care, do they feel safe in the office where the vast majority of the people who are being treated there are female? How do you address that and, and in what ways are you uh, treating your, your patients with dignity and respect? What resources are available to health professionals to better understand the health needs of transgender and gen gender nonconforming patients? I believe that the American Medical Association, um, the Endocrinological Society, I don't know if I said that word right, um, the folks who do endocrinology, uh, <laughs> And uh, the pediatric physicians have all developed statements that talk about the, ne the medical necessity for transition-related care for trans folks. Uh, <clears throat> the World Professional Association for Transgender Health is another resource for folks. Uh, that's a professional organization of psychologists, physicians, uh, lawyers, social workers, people from a variety of professions that come together every other year for a symposium uh, to hear about the latest, greatest uh, information around treating and working with trans folks. <clears throat> for people who are working with children and adolescents, the endocrino endocrinologists have a statement around how to do that work, especially with adolescents. Uh, there's more and more use of puberty suppression treatments mm -hmm. with adolescents. Uh, unfortunately, that's very expensive uh, and typically is not something that's going to be covered by somebody's insurance. Right. <clears throat> I, I said before the importance of providers getting their own training on this information. <clears throat> Another place where people can access that kind of training would be at the different trans health conferences that happen around the country. There's one in Philadelphia every year in June. Uh, there's one in Seattle, uh, typically in August. I believe there's also one down in uh, Southern California. And I know in the past there's been one in the Minneapolis area. Um, <clears throat> and I think that the Southern Comfort Conference that happens in Atlanta this time of year might also have a health a provider segment to what they're doing. Uh, so there are a variety of places and ways that people can get involved. For physicians, there's also the Gay Lesbian Medical Association that would be another place where people could possibly get some training and also talk and work with folks who are doing work with the trans community. So many of these resources are available online? Oh, every single one of those have online uh, uh, 
facing information to them. Yeah. So it would be very easy for <clears throat> anybody to be able to yep. access this online yep. and yep. get the training they would need. <clears throat> yep, and the nice thing with, uh, for example, Glamma and WPATH both, they have provider directories. So if mm -hmm. this is something that somebody's specializing in, or at least has enough knowledge to be able to do culturally competent work, that's one way that trans folks can find providers that they know that they'll feel safe with. Uh, so become uh, not only a member of those organizations, but also put your information up there to be a provider. So what key concepts are important for all health professionals to know about transgender health? And um, where and how can they be taught within the healthcare professions? I think there are th three things that come immediately to mind. The first is the importance of treating the organ systems that are present with the patient that they're working with. So a trans man, so someone who was born female and is living as male, is never going to have a prostate. So there's no reason to do that prostate exam. Uh, likewise, a trans woman, uh, there are plenty of things that she doesn't need, but yet she does need a prostate exam. So the importance of addressing those organs that are present for the person uh, and doing that in a respectful way, that may mean, and this leads me to my second point, that the provider needs to serve as an advocate for that person. Because often insurance companies have those kinds of procedures are coded based on the gender that the insurance company believes that the person is. So <clears throat> um, serving as an advocate uh, on behalf of the, the patient to make sure that they get that coverage because that's, that's, the part, that's part of who they are. Um, and uh, the third piece on that is I think there's just so much that we can do around interdisciplinary care and addressing the full uh, needs of our patients and the people that we see. If someone needs a referral uh, for mental health treatment, provide that and make sure that you get them with somebody who's gonna provide trans, trans affirmative uh, competent care. <clears throat> uh, and I thought of a fourth one. Uh, that's the increased use of informed consent models for treatment especially as it relates to hormones. Uh, as long as the trans person understands what hormones can and can't do, uh, the effects of those hormones, uh, the costs associated with hormones, the possible health risks that they might have, any internal medicine provider can get somebody started on hormones. They don't need to see an endocrinology specialist. Right. Now, if things start to go haywire, labs come back um, that aren't consistent with what you would expect, then go ahead and make that referral to that specialist. But there's no reason why a trans person couldn't be started on hormones by any internist, because they should have enough of a basic knowledge of hormones and what they can and can't do to get somebody started. And, and the importance with the informed consent model is that we're not putting undue barriers in somebody's way that's preventing them from being able to realize who they are as a gendered person. Good. Is there any last thoughts that you have on this topic? There's, there's one big one, and that's around the importance of infusing training that medical providers are getting with a variety of uh, examples around working with trans folks. So it's not that we want you to spend one hour in all of your medical school training talking about the transgender person because there is no single one way that, that a person is going to present. Uh, and so to the extent that that can be interspersed across the curriculum uh, over the four years that somebody's in medical school and then the time that they spend in residency, that's critical. Uh, we are doing a disservice to the trans folks in the medical community uh, by the limited amount of instruction that folks are getting right. on those topics. And, and it's more than just HIV risk. Like, if that's all you're gonna talk about with trans folks, then, then spend your hour doing that. But there's so much more that people need to understand about the healthcare needs 
of trans folks. Okay, thank you very much. All right.